Welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for attending today's webinar session. My name is Katrin Trung. I am a Corporate Tax Manager at Grant Thornton Singapore and I am delighted to be hosting today's webinar session. So you might be able to see my video but um, maybe not. Uh, I may look Singaporean but you can, might be able to tell from my accent I am not. I am actually Australian. Uh, having joined Grand Thornton Singapore back in May 2018. So today's session is really just to discuss some of the GST considerations on cross-border services. So in particular around digital services, especially uh, in Singapore where we've had some changes to the GST regime, which was implemented at the beginning of this year. And while we're focusing mostly on Singapore, we will touch on some of the global and regional Asia-Pacific developments around this area as well. Uh, today's session will be presented by Jeremy O'Neill, who is a senior manager at Grand Thornton Singapore. So, so Jeremy is a very experienced manager at, in our indirect tax team, uh, having previously worked in both the UK and Dubai before joining Singapore in January 2019. So before I pass on to Jeremy to start the presentation, just a couple of um, housekeeping. So today's session will be recorded and we will send out a link to the recording following today's webinar. Uh, we also have a Q&A session. Uh, we'll dedicate some time at the end of the pre presentation to go through some Q&A. You will see that there is a Q&A chat box. Please feel free to type in your questions and we'll try and address as many questions as we can um, at the end. So without further ado, I might hand over to Jeremy to start our presentation then. Jeremy. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, as Catherine mentioned, um, we today on the webinar, we're gonna look at uh, so sort of the growing trend of the data digitization uh, within uh, the tax regimes across not just with within Singapore but regionally across APAC and also globally as well. Um, I've elected um, to split this webinar into two different sections. Um, to begin with we're going to deal with cross-border transactions which are specifically from from within business to consumer transactions uh, and this largely focuses on the uh, on the various digital service tax regimes that have been implemented uh, and then the second half of the webinar is going to look at the, the business to business uh, cross-border transactions and look at how tax authorities uh, what mechanisms they are using uh, to tax those types of transactions as well. So to begin with, as I said, I'm gonna look at the business to consumer transactions. Um, some of you may remember where it all began. Um, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, commonly referred to as the, the, the OECD, released their first report in about July, 2013. And it highlighted a number of, a number of gaps and risks arising from the tax world falling behind the, the ever evolving and digitization of the business world. Um, and GST and VAT was just part of their, uh, was just part of their in analysis. Um, so just to put it into a bit, a bit of background, historically, virtually all cross-border transactions were, when we're talking, uh, B2C were not subject to VAT or GST. The reason being because the supplier uh, in the country where they're supplying the digital services from uh, were generally entitled to zero rate their supply from their country because they are selling it to a person that is not within their country. And historically, uh, the tax authorities within the recipient country generally did not have a mechanism in place uh, to capture to capture the taxation of such services. So, just to sort of give a quick uh, a quick summary of how we got to where we are, um, the the OECD also um, 
had a report on base erosion profit sh sh profit shifting commonly referred to as BEPS, uh, and that was that was set up to identify the main the main difficulties uh, that the digital economy poses uh, for the application of the existing international tax rules and try and develop some options and mechanisms uh, for how these gaps can be addressed uh, by taking a holistic approach um, during which that they would consider both direct and the 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 indirect tax regimes within the jurisdictions. Um, so the, Be the BEPS Action 1, um, which was announced in their 2015 report, uh, that focused on uh, the digital economy. Uh, and within the report, they basically, they basically concluded uh, that it would not be feasible and possible to ring fence the digital economy from the, the rest of the economy and therefore um, they would have to uh, they would have to come up with recommendations for how to treat the, uh, for, for how to for how to 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 update uh, the existing tax le legislation designed for the bricks and and mortar economy to also include that of the digital economy uh, and the main the, the main crux of the challenge around the BEPS action plan one was how tax authorities are able to tax businesses that are selling to consumers within their country but when that business does not have an establishment an establishment an establishment or presence uh, within that country so that sort of gives you a picture of what of how we got here globally. In terms of now narrowing it, narrowing it down and looking at how we got here from a Singapore perspective, um, the first thing we heard from a Singapore perspective uh, was from uh, Finance Minister Heng, who is obviously now the Deputy Prime Minister as well. Uh, in the 2017 budget, he acknowledged that there was a need to update and effectively digital proof uh, the Singapore GST regime. Uh, and during uh, his statement, he announced that Singapore was considering implementing a new regime to, to address the current distortion in the GST treatment from, from the domestic suppliers and those who are selling from from outside Singapore. He then he then updated us in the budget 2018 and he announced officially uh, that Singapore would launch the the overseas the, the overseas vendor registration uh, with effect from the 1st of January 2020 and draft legislation uh, proceeded to follow. Uh, and I will touch on the legislation in the next slide. Um, so we're now nine months in, well, just come to the end of the, the eighth month uh, within the new re regime. Uh, in terms of how they legislated uh, for the new regime, they implemented two new sections uh, within the GST legislation. Uh, the first being uh, within within section eight, and that tells us or de defines what, what is a taxable supply for the purposes of the regime. Um, the, the second part of the new legislation was the, was in the seventh schedule of the GST Act, uh, and that um, within the schedule, it effectively uh, defines what we mean by digital uh, by digital services, uh, and it also outlines the rules applicable for online marketplaces and intermediaries. Um, as part of that, the IRS also uh, publicised an he tax guide uh, to explain the, the details of the legislation uh, within more layman's terms. 
and also to outline their interpretation uh, of how the legislation should be should be implemented and read in practice. So, in terms of practical terms, um, first of all, businesses need to consider a number of factors uh, to determine whether they are subject uh, or caught within the the new overseas vendor registration regime. Uh, the first one is we need to understand uh, well, the, the first position is we, uh, we need to revert back to the default concepts in order for, uh, for a business to be to, to understand whether they're subject to the regime. They first need to consider uh, whether they are making a supply of digital services whether that supply is made by a taxable person, whether that supply is consumed within Singapore, and of course, whether that supply is made in the course or furtherance of a business. Um, from that, there are, there are two key factors uh, that, that businesses will need to understand uh, in order to come to the right conclusion. Um, the, the first one is we need to be able to understand what is what is meant by a digital service what is the definition of a digital service uh, i have actually included an extract of the definition for a digital service within the orange text below uh, and the second point is we need to understand what constitutes a taxable person in other words a business may be may be making supplies of digital services, but it may not be a taxable person to begin with. So, in terms of addressing the first question, what is a digital service? As I mentioned, uh, the seventh schedule actually provides a definition of what is a digital ser service, uh, and it also provides a non-exhausted list of examples as well. Um, so I've included the most common examples over the next couple of slides. Um, the, the ones we would all be familiar with would be uh, the, digital the, di the digital content and products. So this is the likes of, of the applications that we download from the Apple's iTunes store or the Google Play store. Uh, another very common one uh, that certainly uh, that I uh, would purchase personally, personally is a subscription uh, to multimedia content. So whether that's the likes of Netflix or Spotify, whatever platform we would use to stream digital content to our various devices, whether that, that's through our telephone or to our te to our televisions um, within our living of rooms at home. Um, a few more examples uh, would be any online mom, online marketplaces. So that could be the likes of eBay, uh, Carousel. Uh, it includes hotel, hotel booking websites as well. Uh, and one other common example is live streaming services. I guess the point with the live streaming services is we need to to understand whether there's any human interaction uh, within the actual streaming of that content in the first place. Um, they've also provided a list of some excluded digital services. Um, as I mentioned, the fundamental principle of the overseas vendor registration is to level the playing field between the domestic, uh, the domestic suppliers of these services and businesses that are, that are not established within Singapore, but supplying to consumers within Singapore. And therefore, uh, the IRS have, have excluded a number of transactions because if these transactions were procured from a Singapore business, they would not have been subject to 7% GST in the first place. And therefore, to retain the level playing field, they've also set, they've also confirmed that if these services um, were supplied by by an overseas company, 
then that they would also not be subject to 7% GST. So now we have an understanding for what is a digital service in the first place. We need to consider, well, what actually constitutes a taxable person. Uh, and Singapore has a generous two-tier th two -tier threshold compared to a lot of other jurisdictions. Uh, the first test is that the overseas business has a global taxable turnover in, ex in excess of 1 million Singapore dollars. Uh, now, a lot of you will realize that that is actually the same as the domestic threshold. Uh, and this is to ensure that there is still a similar playing field uh, between the domestic and the, the overseas suppliers. The second test, which they've implemented just for the overseas bundle re registration, is that that overseas business must be selling in excess of 100,000 Singapore dollars worth of B2C, B2C supplies of digital services. And just like under the standard regime, uh, the thresholds are applied on the retrospective and the prospective basis. So under the retrospective basis, um, the, the overseas business would have to consider whether in the last calendar year, whether they made, whether they breached those thresholds. So at the moment, uh, a business would not be liable to register under the retrospective basis because we haven't yet come uh, obviously to the 31st of December 2020. So businesses will need to consider uh, the retrospective test from January 2021 going, going forwards. Uh, and then under the prospective, under the prospective basis, which is uh, how all the companies that are currently registered for the OVR have become liable to, to register is the prospective basis. And that is whether within the next 12 months, you expect to exceed those two tier thresholds. And if you do expect to exceed those thresholds, then you have, you have the 30 day notice period uh, to notify the tax authorities and register for the OVR GST regime. So now we know um, what is a supply of digital services, who is a taxable person. We now need to consider uh, who the supply is being made to in the first place. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the regime is specifically targeted at B to C transactions. And therefore, the business will need to consider who they are contracting with in the first place. Um, the IRS have, um, have come up with uh, the legislation and it determines that the default position is that your customer will be considered a consumer. So it will be a B to C transaction unless the customer can provide you with evidence that they are a business. Uh, and the way the IRS would like this to be done is through the provision of their Singapore GST number. Uh, and it's, um, it's a key point that the overseas businesses will need to retain uh, the GST number provided for audit purposes, but they do not have an obligation uh, to validate the GST number in the first place, like uh, they would do in a number of other uh, tax jurisdictions. So once we've considered uh, whether we're set that we are, we are selling to a consumer, we then need to determine whether that consumer is based within, within Singapore and that the supply should be subject to Singapore GST. Uh, as part of the OVR regime, uh, the IRS consulted with a number of other uh, tax jurisdictions such as the European Union, New Zealand and Australia to determine the most effective and efficient way uh, for determining where a consumer is based. Uh, and the, 
the position they came to is that businesses can rely on two pieces of non-contradictory uh, geographic information. Um, and I've listed uh, three, three different types that the IRS have have proved businesses can rely on. Um, the first one is the, the payment proxy. Uh, and that will be the, uh, the country code of the credit card or payment card uh, that the customer has, has used to pay for the digital service or the, the download or their streaming subscription. The second one is the residence proxy and this is where the customer signs up to to the service and they make the declaration the declaration of putting their billing address uh, so this will be uh, the billing address or the home address that the customer uh, declares when they subscribe or when they buy the service the third one is the access proxy uh, and this is uh, the country code or the IP address or the location of the landline through which the customer is accessing uh, the download or the subscription. So if you're streaming, streaming Netflix, for example, to your TV in your living room, it would be based on the, uh, the IP address of the device that is streaming the service. Uh -huh. And so as long as two of those three come back saying the same country, then the overseas business is able to conclude that the consumer is based within that country. And therefore, if that country is Singapore, the supply is deemed as been made within Singapore and therefore would be subject to Singapore GST as part of the overseas vendor registration regime. Um, I have also been working with a couple of clients and HIRAS uh, because they sometimes uh, have problems retaining uh, two or three pieces of th this geographic data. Um, so the IRS are also open to other commercially available evidence uh, that the overseas business may be able to to obtain from the consumer, uh, but those would have to be pre-agreed uh, with the IRS uh, prior to their, their implementation. I also mentioned that in this seventh schedule, um, there are specific rules for marketplaces and intermediaries. Um, and in short, what the rules what the what the rules determine is that the marketplace will be the deemed principal within the supply of the digital services, unless a number of commercial factors are met. There's about five or six requirements um, that must not be met in order for uh, the marketplace to not be considered the principal. Uh, and based on mo on most of the terms and conditions and commercial arrangements uh, within the industry, uh, it's unlikely that the deeming provisions will not apply. In other words, 99 out of 100 times, the, the marketplace will be deemed to be the principal in the supply. Uh, and the policy rationale behind this was that uh, from an IRS perspective, it's far more efficient and effective for them to have a small number of taxable persons which collect a large amount of the revenue. So by making the online marketplaces liable for the GST, they only have to register that one marketplace rather than the hundreds or thousands of underlying suppliers which are supplying the apps or the digital content through the marketplace. So in effect, um, you have a position where 10% of the businesses that are registered uh, for the regime are collecting in excess of 90% of the GST. Uh, and therefore it's very cost effective and, and is very effective from an, an administration perspective uh, in the position of the tax authorities.
Um, in terms of um, from a reporting aspect and a compliance aspect, um, with the intention of encouraging compliance and reducing the administration burden on these overseas suppliers, uh, the IRS have implemented a simplified registration and reporting process um, so that overseas businesses only simply need to report the value of their sales transactions plus the GST charged on their GST return. In other words, they don't have to declare or they're not entitled to declare the value of their taxable purchases and any GST, uh, any, any input tax on the GST return purely because they're overseas businesses and therefore they're very unlikely to incur domestic Singapore costs and domestic GST and therefore there's no no need to make them report those figures as well. The second area where they've significantly reduced uh, the administration burden is they've not, uh, they don't require the overseas businesses to comply with local invoicing requirements. Now what I mean by that is uh, the overseas businesses can use their standard invoicing template from their home country rather than updating uh, the format of the tax invoice to comply with the Singapore requirements. Um, and the third one is that uh, the overseas businesses, if they do find an error within their previous returns, they can simply correct it on their, on their next return, no matter what the value. So they would not have a need to go back and amend uh, the prior period in which uh, the error the the error took place. So now, sort of just taking a step back uh, to appreciate uh, the the challenge and the the GST risks that businesses based within this industry. There are currently in excess of 50 countries globally. Um, there are 13 within APAC currently that have implemented an OVR or similar GST digital service regime. Uh, uh, as we can see from the two graphics here, I've listed um, the countries within the APAC region that have implemented the regime and the date that they have implemented. And I've also done the, the same for the Europe, Middle East and Africa region as well. And as we can see from the timeline, uh, there has been a consistent growing trend since the release of the, the OECD report in 2015. And even today, as we stand here today, there are still there are still more countries which are in the process of implementing uh, the regime, whether it's just at discussion phase or whether they're actually at the stage of draft legislation, uh, such as the Philippines and Thailand. Um, I guess one of the key points to note as well from a risk perspective is that the Europe, Middle East and Africa region, the average rate of VAT or, or GST is significantly higher uh, than it is within APAC. So personally, I'll be interested to see in times of COVID where tax author authorities are looking to raise additional revenue, where we will, whether we will see a slight uptick in the GST and VAT rates generally within APAC. So we can obviously see that a lot of countries have, have implemented an overseas regime or GST digital service tax regime. One of the big challenges that businesses face uh, when such regimes are entered into unilaterally by countries rather than multilaterally as a whole region or globally is the additional compliance and the administration. Um, it effectively means that companies must monitor all the rules in each and every jurisdiction separately. Uh, one of the uh, 
additional challenges uh, for for the APAC region, which uh, businesses don't face within the European Union, is that um, there is no there, there's no supernatural being that is responsible for the GST or VAT legislation on a regional on a regional basis, whereas the European Union has the principal VAT directive, where all 28 member states are bound to agree to the legislation and it's only small tweaks uh, that countries can can make on a jurisdictional basis um, the the largest differences we see from from country to country uh, include things like uh, the turnover thresholds so some countries actually have a zero threshold and then we have Singapore, which has a threshold of $100,000 worth of digital services. Um, there are also differences in the scope and the definition of digital services from country to country. Um, there are also different, different rules to determine the location of the customer in country to country. So some countries would purely look at the country code of the payment card uh, because they're of the view that that is the hardest geographic code to manipulate uh, well, whereas your access proxy and your customer your, your, your customer address can be manipulated in certain situations uh, you have different invoicing and reporting requirements in country to country. They each have their own version of the GST or VAT return. Uh, and all of this uh, obviously results in the potential need to get in country advice for every jur jurisdiction where you have your customers based, uh, which obviously significantly increases the administration and compliance cost. So just by way of example, uh, I've included a quick comparison for a number of jurisdictions. Um, uh, as we can see, ju just across the, the five jurisdictions uh, that I've chosen here, there are a number of d d differences. Uh, the differences even include whether the regime applies on B2C or B2B transactions. So Malaysia, for example, has implemented their regime on the 1st of January, and that applies uh, to overseas businesses selling to consumers and to businesses uh, within Malaysia. So that therefore that's one of the key differences uh, between Malaysia and a lot of other countries. Uh, and we, as I mentioned, there are differences in the definitions and the examples of the services that are included and the registration thresholds. Uh, uh, jurisdictions such as the European Union and South Korea don't currently have a threshold, whereas Singapore, Malaysia and Australia do. But the value of those thresholds uh, substantially changes uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And obviously the rate of tax uh, will be different from jurisdiction and jurisdiction as well. So as you can see, that, that, that sort of gives you an insight into the practical challenges, uh, the compliance and the re reporting challenges that these uh, global, the global tech or digital service companies uh, face uh, and the practical challenges of trying to monitor in excess of 50 different uh, regimes. So I think that's uh, that's the section for uh, for digital uh, for digital services on B to C uh, transactions. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. What we might do is maybe take a pause here before we move on to the next session um, of it, which will be uh, on B2B transactions and maybe flex Jeremy's brain a little bit by asking some questions. So, I mean, if with the OVR, 
have a look at uh, a couple of slides ago. So Singapore's implemented it uh, this year, which is, you know, a little later than some of um, the jurisdictions around the world, especially within the region. So, you know, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, for example, have had this regime uh, for a while now. How effective do you think the OVR regime has been based on th those countries? And do you think it's actually addressing the issues that are coming out of the BEPS action plan? Um, yeah, that's a, the, that's a good question. Um, it, in terms of from a Singapore perspective to begin with, uh, as you mentioned, it was only recently implemented in uh, Jan January 2020. So we've got limited data to base it on at the moment. Uh, in terms of the information we have received from IRS, uh, they've said uh, that in effective of, I think it was about Q2 2020, they had about 120 businesses that had registered uh, for GST under the OVR regime. Um, unfortunately, they haven't yet publicized how much GST those businesses have collected. Uh, but mm. sort of just taking a step back from to a regional and a global perspective. Um, mm -hmm. To answer the question, I do think it has certainly begun to address uh, mm. the vast non-taxation of digital services mm -hmm. uh, in that we are now capturing those cross-border B2C transactions that mm. historically were never captured before in the supplier's jurisdiction or the jurisdiction of consu consumption. Um, mm. But in terms of, I still believe that it can become more effective and efficient uh, due to the fact that countries have taken unilateral approach and there are these differences in their regimes. Yeah. There are still cases that we see on a daily basis where there's risk of double or no taxation, mm -hmm. which is caused by the different sort of classifications, whether it's B to C, B to B, uh, the how to determine the location of the customer, uh, the scope of the services. Um, so it has made a good step towards addressing uh, the gap identified in the, the BEPS Action Plan 1. Um, but it hasn't quite uh, hasn't quite covered everything as of yet. So I still think there are some improvements uh, that can be made. Yep. Obviously, one well, one of the biggest challenge is that it's very hard to agree tax legislation and policy yes. on a regional or global basis mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. these tax authorities they want jurisdiction and control from where they collect the yes. revenue from yep. within their own borders. I mean, yes, you touch on a good point. Uh, I mean, these BAPS action plans, it's, it's, it is a really big project because how do you get all these jurisdictions to actually implement these in their own jurisdictions as well? So thank, thanks for your insight, Jeremy. Um, and maybe just one other question before we move on as well. So, you know, as we said, there are challenges with this because of this unilateral action. Uh, you know, jurisdictions are implementing their own regime. So, and you can see from the slide before there, there are some differences. So what are some of those practical differences that you've seen between the Singapore regime and maybe say the EU um, MOS regime? Um. Yeah, I would say that because because Singapore actually did a lot of consultation with other jurisdictions and it took a large amount of input uh, from the European regime, uh, they've actually aligned the Singapore re regime relatively closely uh, to the European regime. So I wouldn't say there's as many discrepancies between the European the European model and the Singapore model, other than sort of the threshold to begin with. The reason why Singapore wanted a threshold is because they wanted to keep a level playing field between the Singapore suppliers. If they're selling suppliers less than $1 million, they're not required to charge GST. So why should they require the overseas businesses to charge GST? Uh, 
if they are mm -hmm. making supplies less than a million. Yes. Uh, the bigger difference is that I come across uh, is mainly within APAC, uh, where, for example, uh, Taiwan, for example, they determine the location of the customer based on the, 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 the country code of the payment card. Wow, now, okay. from a Singapore perspective, if, for example, the, my country code of the payment card said Taiwan, but my billing address and my access proxy say Singapore, then I'm required to charge Singapore GST. But Taiwanese authorities are saying, well, you should charge Taiwanese VAT because the, the bank payment card belongs to Taiwan. And therefore, that's where you have occasions of potential double taxation. Uh, and it causes real problems for businesses in terms of how do they commercially decide uh, where they should pay that tax. Hi, Jeremy. Um, okay. Um, and yeah, sh with that, I think I'll move on to the the B2B transactions. So this is where we're looking at a supply of services uh, effectively between two GST or VAT registered persons in different countries. Um, as most of you will be aware, Singapore implemented what's referred to as the reverse charge also back in January 2020. Uh, the, the policy rationale behind this was that previously there was a distortion in the tax treatment of services procured from overseas supplies as compared with domestic uh, supplies. Historically, on the left-hand side, the orange circle, uh, domestic GST, uh, domestic supplies were required to charge GST uh, on their services, whereas the overseas businesses were not required to charge GST, and therefore the Singapore business was procuring those services is from overseas with no GST. Um, the, therefore, that was resulting in a cost saving for a, a certain industry of businesses uh, and also negatively impacting the Singapore economy because it was incentivizing Singapore businesses to procure services from overseas rather than in the domestic market. Um, so the reverse charge is effectively trying to level that playing field in terms of taxing the services procured from the overseas businesses. Um, just by way of a quick example, uh, we have an overseas service provider with a Singapore business recipient. Let's say uh, the overseas service provider is providing legal services to the business here in Singapore. With the reverse charge now in place, the Singapore business would be required to account or would be required to deem output tax on the value of the service that has been procured. In our example, that's 10,000. So the output GST to pay would be $700. Now, this is also a taxable purchase by the Singapore business because it is procuring the services and therefore it's taxable purchase. It is also valued at 10,000. In my example, the Singapore business is fully taxable and therefore is entitled to reclaim all the GST on its costs and it can reclaim the $700 as input tax. The net result of that is obviously a, a nil tax payable. So for that reason, the IRS have excluded fully taxable businesses from the reverse charge. And if I were to just sort of elaborate on that and look at the same transaction for a partially exempt business, so in other words, a business that's not entitled to reclaim all the GST on its costs, um, the, the Singapore business would still be requ required to deem the $700 of output tax on its return, and it would then treat that as input tax. However, because it's only entitled to reclaim a percentage of its GST, so in my example, we have a a fully licensed bank, which has a fixed input tax recovery of 72%. It's only entitled to reclaim 72% of the output tax of $700, which therefore re 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 results in a net tax payable of $196. And that would have been exactly the same position 
as if the bank had procured the legal services from a domestic law firm because the law firm would have charged them the $700 on the $10,000 worth of legal services. And they would have only been entitled to reclaim the $504 of the GST charged by the, the local law firm. So sort of just to summarize in terms of who will be impacted, uh, as I mentioned, if you're a GST registered business, you will only be affected by the reverse charge if you're not entitled to reclaim all the GST on your costs, or if you're part of a GST group uh, that is partially exempt and therefore not entitled to reclaim the GST on your costs. The second category of, uh, of businesses that will be impacted or could be impacted is our non-GST registered businesses. So these are businesses that are not yet registered for GST because they, because they haven't yet made a million dollars worth of taxable supplies. Um, so if you are such business and you procure one million dollars worth of services from overseas suppliers, and if you were to be registered, we're, would be making exempt supplies and therefore uh, not entitled to reclaim all the GST on your costs, then you will, you will now be required to register for GST under the reverse charge method. Uh, and you will therefore become a GST a registered business and you will move from the right box to the left box. And so you will still be impacted uh, by the reverse charge on a go forward basis. So sort of now we've addressed who is impacted by the reverse charge. We also need to consider what services are actually subject to the reverse charge in the first place. Um, in short, uh, the default position is that the reverse charge applies to all services except for those explicitly excluded under the eighth schedule of the GST Act, which is a new schedule that was implemented uh, back in January as well. And the policy rationale behind the excluded services is that if they were procured from a Singapore business or a Singapore government, then they would not have been subject to GST. And on that same basis, if they are therefore procured from an overseas business, they should also not be subject to GST to ensure the level playing field uh, between the two, the, the, two, the two situations. One point uh, to mention is that the IRS also have implemented some anti-avoidance measures uh, as part of the reverse charge. So historically, any supply between two members of the same GST group or between a branch and its parent office would have been disregarded for, for, for GST because they're considered the same taxable person. However, for the purposes of the reverse charge only, they are treated as two separate taxable persons. And therefore, any cross-border transactions between GST group members or between a branch and its parent office will be subject to GST in Singapore under the reverse charge. Uh, and the reason for this is uh, to ensure that uh, the, these cross-border transactions are, are still subject to, to GST uh, and to stop companies offshoring uh, the services and then bringing them back in the country through a an inter company transfer or through a company, uh, through a Singapore uh, branch and company transfer. The last point uh, to note on the B2B cross-border services is that with the implementation of the re reverse charge, uh, the Ministry of Finance and the IRS have also amended uh, a number of the zero rating international uh, service provisions for, for outbound services. So these are services, these are services supplied by a Singapore business to companies which belong overseas. Um, the reason uh, 
why they've relaxed the zero rating provisions is that the reverse charge is capturing and addressing the risk of the round tipping or offshoring as it's also commonly known that was possible uh, back in uh, prior to the, the implementation uh, of the reverse charge. So, so I, I've just uh, I've just got an illustration to sort of explain the changes. Uh, so we have a Singapore service provider that has a contract with company A based in the UK. Uh, however, uh, we also have a subsidiary of company A based in Singapore. And it's the subsidiary within Singapore that's the beneficiary of the service provided by the Singapore company. So prior to the 1st of January, even though the, the contract and the invoice was with what was between the Singapore company and company A based in the UK, the Singapore company had to consider the directly benefiting test. And because that service they were providing was directly benefiting the subsidiary uh, of company A, which is based in Singapore, they were not entitled to zero rate their invoice to company A and actually had to charge Singapore GST on that invoice. And that is because historically, historically any recharge from company A to the subsidiary of company A would have not been subject to GST. However, with the implementation of the reverse charge, any transaction between company A in the UK and the subsidiary of company in Singapore would now be subject to GST on the reverse charge. And because of that, the Singapore service provider is now entitled to zero rate his invoice to company A. So it is effectively relaxing uh, the directly benefiting test and is easing the administration uh, for the Singapore service provider um, so that in a number of situations, he only needs to consider who he is contracting, contracting and raising his invoice to rather than look at, well, who's the beneficiary of my service? Uh, and on that point, uh, we've come to the end of the, the, the presentation. Um, Catherine, I'll hand it back over to you in terms of managing uh, the Q&A section. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I think it's been very interesting to see how businesses and government, sorry, governments and tax authorities have been trying to respond to these digital services and all these digital businesses. So maybe, as I mentioned, there is a Q&A chat box function. So please feel free to drop in your questions and we'll try and get through as many of, of them as we can now. Um, so maybe I can start with a general question first, Jeremy, and around, you know, if, if I was a business selling to other countries and specifically digital services, you know, what should I consider first or what should I, sh how should I approach this and what should I do first? Um, that's a very good question. And one that, that clients come to us with, uh, Quite a lot of the time. So, so let's say we have a Singapore business, and as you say, it's providing digital services to a host of countries across the globe. Um, what we, where we tend to start is obviously we need to understand uh, the precise nature of the digital services that they are providing, uh, and we also need them to map out well, where are your consumers based? Where are you selling these digital services? is two and we would then sort of draw up a a heat map so we we would have a list of countries that they are selling to where their consumers are based uh, it's also helpful to have a value for each country uh, and then generally we take a risk-based approach so what i mean by that is we would look we would look at where the majority of their roof their revenue is coming from and try and address those countries to begin with to begin with because as you can imagine uh, these projects can be rather large projects when you're talking about a single business selling to in excess of potentially 50 countries that have such regime you can't implement all the countries at the same time uh, so we tend to take a risk based approach um, 
depending on the, the jurisdiction that they are sending to. Okay, thanks. Um, I think this is a question that came in through around the OVR. Uh, so someone just asked uh, around what is the impact of this OVR on higher education sector, um, especially where they're switching between um, instructions to online to Singapore students. So I think these are not pre-recorded sessions. So I think they're just yep. delivering training, especially relevant now in COVID-19 world that we're living in. Yes, yes, it, it's certainly relevant. And it is, it's something that we are seeing both Singapore educational providers and overseas educational pro providers uh, having challenges with um, and what I mean by that is because in a lot of other jurisdictions not in Singapore uh, education suppliers are actually ex are exempt from GST if they're provided by a domestic business so I just had a query come in from uh, Grant Thornton in the UK they have a client who is an English foreign language training provider mm -hmm. with it within England, within the European Union, English as a foreign language is generally exempt from, from GST. However, they actually have, uh, they have uh, students here in Singapore and they need, and they now need to consider whether their online tuition is subject to Singapore GST under this new regime. Um, generally, well, as I say, there are differences between each of the jurisdictions, but generally the, 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 the definition of digital services means it has minimal or no human interaction. Yeah. So the, the general position for most jurisdictions is that, for example, the webinar here, this involves human interaction. I am sitting here right now speaking to you you. It is de it's delivered by electronic means, but I'm actively here speaking. Mm -hmm. So that would generally not be subject to the digital service regimes. However, if this was pre-recorded and you could click on it and view it and download it whenever you wanted, then it doesn't. Then it is very likely to meet the definition of digital service and would be subject to tax in each of those countries. Um, so it is definitely a challenge uh, that educational institutions uh, need to come up against and again they generally need to consider it on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis yeah okay thanks thanks jeremy i think uh someone's also asked around the reverse charge and whether or not it's applicable to online ads such as facebook and google ads uh, yes um as i mentioned uh the default position is that um all services are subject to the reverse charge. Uh, one, of, one of the challenges we sometimes see with Facebook and Google Ads is they're also registered uh, for the overseas vendor registration. And if they're selling B to C, then they will ch often charge GST. So if the Singapore recipient is not re registered for GST, but is still doing business, um, the, the Facebook and Google would generally charge them GST. However, if you, the, the Singapore business, have obviously provided you your GST number to Facebook, to Google, uh, I think Google, the charges generally come from Ireland, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, when you receive the Google ad ch ch charges, your monthly invoice, that would be subject to, to GST under the reverse charge. Obviously, provided you're not a fully taxable business, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you are, in fact, uh, you as a Singapore company are, are liable to the reverse charge. But the, the default position is, is that, yes, the charges from Facebook and Google Ads would be subject to the reverse charge in yeah. Singapore. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think another question, and I think some of these questions are in relation to this directly benefit test that you touched on the last, yep. was around, uh, so this person has asked, you know, if we, if a Singapore company provides some services to a UK company, legal services um, in particular, 
which does have a subsidiary company in Singapore, then do we do that? Would they need to charge GST on the invoice? So I think this is around that slide that you have up right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of pre first of January, yes, they would have been required to charge GST at 7% on their invoice to company A in the UK because the service or the work was done for the subsidiary, which was a Singapore company. However, from the, from post the 1st of January, as long as the Singapore subsidiary is, re is registered for GST in Singapore, the Singapore service provider will be entitled to zero rate their invoice to company A. So I guess the key point to note is if you're considering this type of transaction, you need to understand whether the Singapore co, which is benefiting from that service, is registered for, for, for GST. Um, the easiest way to check that is just to go onto the IRS website uh, and you, there's a search function that you can type in the company name and you can check and confirm if they're registered for GST. So you, you wouldn't need to ask company A or the subsidiary of company A to confirm that. You, your accounts team or your finance team can actively go do that on the IRS website themselves. Yeah. So that's probably a key point uh, to, to, to take away if you're, uh, you're invoicing or contracting within that that type of arrangement. Um, I'm conscious that it's now a little bit over time. So maybe we'll just have one last question before we wrap up. Um, for the questions that we have not gotten to, uh, if you drop us uh, your email address, we can try and get back to your questions directly. Um, I will flash up our, our LinkedIn profile as well if you don't have our email addresses. But maybe one last question that someone's had is around, you know, with digital services, is it, does it include sort of the annual subscription application or selling online itself? And I'm guessing we're selling online. Uh, we, you know, specifically maybe selling goods online. Does that digital service OBR regime sort of apply to that? Um, so I guess the first point we need to consider is uh, well, what is the customer receiving for that subscription in the first place? Um, obviously, if we take a very simplistic example, look at Netflix, look at Spotify. The reason you're paying the subscription is to give you access to that media content. You don't actually have to stream it, but that's you, you, you're, you're paying the subscription for the right to stream that content and therefore that would obviously uh, be caught by the OVR. Um, in terms of uh, things like booking websites, so hotel booking websites or online marketplaces where custom, where suppliers would advertise their goods for sale, uh, the online marketplace is, sort of, is acting as an intermediary for mm -hmm. to facilitate that transaction. So if we look at at eBay, for example, as one of the most prominent global online selling marketplaces, um, they generally charge a selling commission to mm -hmm. the seller. And if that, um, if the seller is based in Singapore, then in theory, that commission would be subject to Singapore GST because it's a supply of, di of digital services. Because if you look at the, the back end of the, the eBay platform, all the, all the processes behind that are fully automated. There's very little or, or any human interaction within that transactional supply chain. Mm -hmm. So I guess the key point is you need to consider, well, what is the customer getting for what, what they're paying? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we have, so to those who've um, answered some questions, unfortunately we've run out of time. Um, so we, as I said, we will try and um, email you directly. Um, if you've 
ask the question anonymously, can you please provide an email address to us or just drop us an email and we'll try and get back to you on that. Um, Jeremy, do you want to flash up now? Yep, thank you. So if you have any questions, feel free, feel free to contact us through our LinkedIn profiles as well. Uh, but thank you so much, Jeremy, for your presentation. It was very interesting. And thank you to all the participants who have joined us today. I hope you found the session enjoyable and informative. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this session is being recorded. So we will share a copy of this recording um, to you after, after we close today. Uh, if there isn't anything else, well, thank you for joining us today. And I will now end the webinar series. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everyone.